As we begin this study today, I'm going to give to you an introduction. It's going to take a little while. Normally, mine, my introductions do. So uh, I'm just going to read verse 1 here. But what we have, and I chose to entitle this particular installment of our study of Revelation, I chose to entitle it, A Glimpse of Glory. And you'll see that in just a moment. So beginning at, in chapter 4, just reading verse 1, John writes these words. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. We're going to have today in chapter 4 what I've chosen to entitle a, a glimpse of heaven. In order for me to develop that, let me give to you an introduction. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking how there are many books that have been written about people who have said that they have visited heaven. I had gone through a list. There's so many. I just gave you a few. I'll give you a few of books where people have said, I have gone to heaven. You have visions beyond the veil, return from tomorrow, angels on assignment to heaven and back, a glimpse of heaven, visits from heaven, 90 minutes in heaven. And so there's a fascination in our society about testimonies of alleged visits to heaven. But the sad thing about these testimonies is that they're simply not true. There are those who publish books or give testimony of visits to heaven. A man named Gary Wood wrote a book called I Died and Went to Heaven. And in that book, he claimed that he died in 1966 and that it was medically verified that he had died. He also said that he went to heaven and saw body parts, a body parts room full of replacements waiting for people who need them. I'll let that sink in for a moment. Gary said he learned how to access this, and now people are supernaturally getting new body parts in his meetings. There's a woman, a South Korean woman, uh, calls herself a pastor who who says that she's been visiting heaven for more than 20 years, and she says she actually saw Jesus open the sixth seal of Revelation 6 in September 2012. Millions bought a book written in 2010 entitled Heaven is for Real, or they saw the movie. Over 6 million copies were sold in 39 languages. It was written by a pastor claiming his four-year-old son Colton died and went to heaven. In the book, various unscriptural claims were made. Colton said that he saw the Holy Spirit as a kind of bluish image. He said that people have wings, heavenly beings have halos, and Jesus has blue eyes. Anyway, so a pastor by the name of Tim Challies of Grace Fellowship Church in Toronto wrote that, in fact, the story Colton gives is really about the heaven we want, the Jesus we want not the Jesus we've really got who is worthy of worship and won't allow unholiness in heaven. You see, often these supposed glimpses of heaven center on how a person felt while he was there. But the Bible tells us that heaven is filled with God's glory, and his glory would be the most important memory anybody would have. One pastor wrote, stories like Colton's are as dangerous as they are seductive. Readers not only get a twisted, unbiblical picture of heaven, they also imbibe a subjective, superstitious, shallow brand of spirituality. Studying mystical accounts of supposed journeys into the afterlife yields nothing but confusion, contradiction, false hope, bad doctrine, and a host of similar evils. So I need to say this. It's obvious. I don't accept the books and testimonies of those claiming to have visited heaven. You see, in Scripture, we have accounts of those who have seen heaven. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place. The Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were opened. Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. Above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber, 
with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. Notice the emphasis on these actual accounts of glim glimpses of glory. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. When Stephen, the first martyr, had a glimpse in Acts chapter 7, 55 and 56, it says, he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, Paul saw heaven and he said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. When you read these passages, notice that in these descriptions, God's glory and God's majesty is what they are left with. Their reactions are not how they felt about it. Their reaction is how majestic God is. And so what we have here in this chapter is we have John's experience of seeing heaven. And in this chapter, we get a glimpse of glory. The Bible refers to heaven hundreds of times. And John's vision is the most complete description that we find in Scripture. You know, when you buy a home, you have the opportunity of doing what they call a walkthrough. Well, in this chapter, we have an opportunity of doing a walkthrough of heaven. Now, the question is, even before we begin, is, how do we get there? How do you get to heaven? A lot of people think that the, the, uh, the way to get to heaven is to die. You simply die and everybody goes to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven. All good dogs go to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven. That's kind of how people think. All you need to do is die. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, if, if, if it were not so, I go, I go to prepare for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so as he was speaking concerning that, he says, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? And then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How do we get to heaven? Through Jesus Christ. It's not just dying. It's going through Christ. And that's a very important point, especially in these last days, because there are many people saying, all you need to do is die and you go to heaven. No. Everyone will see God, they say. Everyone will see God. That's right. Everyone will, will kneel before God. Everyone will say that he is worthy. Everyone will. Every knee shall bow, the scripture says. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And the way you enter into heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus told us to go throughout the whole world to preach the gospel. Because it's the gospel of Christ, it's Jesus himself who allows us entrance. The way for us to enter into heaven is always going to be through the door, Jesus himself. You come to faith in Christ, you confess your sins, you repent of them, and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. Lord, I need a new life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might live for you. And that's how you enter in to heaven, through Jesus Christ. And John is doing that. And as John gets this glimpse of heaven, he, he is introducing to us what is called the third section of the book of Revelation. Remember in John chapter 1, verse 19, how it reads, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place 
after this. So first, the things which you have seen. That refers to those things recorded in chapter 1. Then he said the things which are. Well, those are the things recorded in chapters 2 and 3. And so the things which shall take place after this are recorded from chapter 4 to chapter 22. What we have in chapters 4 and 5 are an introduction to the events that are revealing, or rather recorded in the rest, in the book, uh, rest of the book. These chapters offer a glimpse into heaven before we see the horror of the tribulation. And the events that follow is what is called, these are the events that follow what is called the church age. From here on, the church is not mentioned. Attention is centered on God's activity. And that's what would be seen. So notice here again in verse 1, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. After these things, described in chapters 2 and 3, John receives further revelation from the Lord. He sees a door standing open. He gets the glimpse. And he says in verse 1, Behold, because what he sees startles him. He's getting a glimpse into the throne room of God, and it astonishes him. You see, Psalm 11, verse 4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. So behold, the door standing open in heaven. Now, when you read your Bible, heaven, the word heaven can be used to describe various things. It's used in three basic ways. Heaven is used concerning earth's atmosphere. It is also used to speak of interplanetary heaven, the heavens, but is also refers to the throne room of God. And so this door is open, and it allows John to enter into God's throne room. Now that's where Jesus is now after his ascension. Remember in the book of Acts in chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, how Jesus was speaking to his men, and he said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the earth. And he goes on to say, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. A cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus ascended, the scripture says, into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, which is a picture of him ruling. When Paul was writing to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 1, he said, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So he's there getting a glimpse of the throne room. And in verse 1 again, the first voice he says, I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here. Like a trumpet, speaks of a sound, of the sound being commanding, authoritative. The first voice reminds us of Revelation 1.10, where the one speaking is Jesus. And John is told, come up here, which is a picture of the rapture. H.A. Ironside, in his lectures on the Revelation, said, the rapture of the apostle is the symbol. Now, Jesus had made a promise to the faithful church in Philadelphia. Remember in chapter 3, verse 10, he said, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Well, the way that the church will be kept from this hour of trial, this tribulation, will be the rapture. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, Paul said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. Our bodies are going to be transformed to make them capable of living in heaven. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18, Paul said, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive, still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. The Lord Jesus Christ, the next 
prophecy on what is called the prophetic calendar, the next one to be fulfilled is the rapture of the church. And it can happen at any moment. Would to God it would happen today. Some of you are saying, I wish it would happen right now. Would to God it would happen today. Come up here. Bang, we're gone. Everything is left behind. All your trouble, all your pain, all your tears, all your sorrow, all diseases, everything is left behind. And we get an opportunity to be transformed instantly and to behold the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. The one who went before us to pre prepare a place for us is awaiting to greet us that we might be with him. And that's something we ought to comfort our hearts with. Look, at we're just passing through. We're, we, we were pilgrims, we're strangers, we're sojourners, we're moving on through. You know, the earth is not our home. Heaven is. Jesus has prepared it for us, and we will be with him. And that's the idea that has fueled the church for 2,000 years. That's how we make it through. That's how people lost everything. That's how people went through so much pain and so much sorrow and so much tribulation and sometimes even into martyrdom because they saw that as just a, a, a momentary thing, a fragmentary thing, because the day is coming. And it won't be that long, guys, till we hear the name, we hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, come up here, and we hear him say to us when we see him, oh, to God, I hope this is so true with us that he might say, well done, well done, my good, my faithful servant. Look at the things that the Lord has prepared for you. And when you have an idea like that, when that motivates you, you can go through anything. John gets a glimpse of what takes place. You see, the scene shifts from things that are occurring on earth to God's throne in heaven. And after this, we see future events. We see, we'll see the tribulation. We'll see what is called the millennial kingdom. We're going to see what is referred to as the eternal state. But John is now telling us what takes place after the church age. The church is removed to the rapture. You see, in verse 2, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, one set on the throne. John is engulfed. He's overwhelmed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Heaven opens up to him. In this overwhelming experience, he is transported into the presence of God. And the following things that we see is an attempt to describe heaven. Notice how he sees the king seated on a heavenly throne, reigning as a one who brings judgment. One of the commentators that I use uh, as I study is a man by the name of Charles Feinberg. Charles Feinberg was a Jewish, was raised as, as, as a Jewish man, was raised as a Jew, uh, uh, a Jewish uh, believer, but he came to faith in Christ and he became one of the great Bible commentators and Charles Feinberg says that the one occupying the throne is Jesus. In John 5, 22, it says the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. In John 5, 27, it says, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the son of man. So the king on the throne reveals his sovereignty as, as a ruler of the universe. Again, let's remember, man does not rule the universe. Jesus does. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so we have a picture of his glory. In John 17, he had prayed and said, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He went on in verse 24 of John 17, and he said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. John gets a picture of glory. And as he does it, he's beginning to try and describe verse 3. He who sat, he who sat there was like a jasper, a sardius stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So he's beginning to describe. He's trying to reveal the glory of the king. He's trying to describe his awesome majesty. And he speaks of these two stones, Jasper and Sardius. Now, why would that be important to note, Jasper and Sardius? When you look in the Old Testament, Israel was led by a spiritual leader called the high priest. The high priest had special garments that he would wear. There were 12 stones attached to the garment of the high priest. And each one of those stones represented a tribe of Israel. 
When you look in Exodus 28, verses 17 through 21, these stones are listed as the first stone and the last stone on his garment. And so this is a picture of God's covenant relationship with Israel. In other words, he has a work to do for Israel. Jasper, Sardius, and a rainbow describes the glory of his appearance. Jasper is crystal clear. Some say it may be a diamond, is representative of purity. Sardius is ruby red. It's a picture of redemption. And so there's a rainbow also around the throne in appearance, he says, like an emerald. Now remember this for a moment. God gave the rainbow as a token of mercy and grace in contrast to judgment. All the way back in Genesis 9, verses 14 through 16, it says, whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. The rainbow is a symbol of God's mercy and grace. Remember that. Because today, the rainbow has been hijacked to represent the things that brought his judgment in the first place. Think about that. The rainbow has been hijacked to replace what God in, at, what at first had brought the flood. When you read through Genesis, it speaks concerning every thought, every imagination of man was only evil continually. And that's why God brought judgment through the flood. And after he destroyed every living creature that, that breathed oxygen from the air, he put his rainbow as a symbol that he would no longer, he would not again bring a flood to destroy. So for for Thousands of years, we have recognized the rainbow as a symbol of God's grace and mercy. But again, as mentioned, that symbol has been hijacked to represent the things that result in judgment. Keep that in mind. Now, in verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. This describes his kingship over man. 24 elders represent the church in the position of reigning. There are those who say these elders are angels. They're not. Angels are never portrayed as ruling. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 14, it speaks of angels as ministering spirits who minister to heirs of salvation. So they're not portrayed as ruling. Angels are never referred to as elders because only men are referred to in Scripture as elders. Angels uh, do appear in white, but white garments is commonly used to speak of believers. And angels do not wear crowns. The crowns that are here are victor's crowns for those who overcame. These are not redeemed Jews because Israel is redeemed during the tribulation. They are not tribulation saints because the tribulation has yet to occur. You'll see that in chapter 7. This means that those spoken of in this passage would be the church. And in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In 2 Timothy 2, 12, Paul said, if we endure we shall also reign with him. And so you're looking at those who are reigning. These are believers. Notice in verse 4, they're clothed in white robes. They have crowns of gold on their heads. Wearing robes signifies their righteousness. They're wearing victor's crowns. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, Paul said, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. He's speaking of the 
victor's crown. These are people who are believers in Christ and they're receiving their crowns. Now it goes on to describe in verse 5, from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now he tries to do something. He tries to describe God's power and God's majesty. In, in this particular verse, by the way, the throne isn't, isn't representing mercy and grace. In this passage, the throne represents judgment because judgment is about to break forth. We already saw that the seven lamps of fire is a visible represent, representation of the, the Holy Spirit. We saw that in chapter 1. Verse 4 in chapter 3, verse 1. Now he begins to describe it. Verse 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. In the midst of the throne and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature, like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, fourth living creature, was like a flying eagle. Now, what are you talking about? I don't know. Let's keep going. No, we'll look at that for a moment. A sea of glass like crystal. Now, we know that the sea of glass, when he uses the word sea, can't be literal because there's no sea in heaven. It's a picture of heaven shining like a brilliant light. There are those, and I agree with this, that may des this may describe, we say this may describe the purity, the holiness of God. It's an attempt to describe that which cannot be described. It's God's throne room. And he's saying God's throne room is beautiful beyond description. He speaks about four living creatures in verse 6. This is a high order of angels guarding the holiness of God. They're stationed, when you look at how it's portrayed, in an inner circle order, and they're nearest to the throne. When you look into the Bible, the cherubim were placed at the entrance of Eden to keep Adam and Eve out, according to Genesis 3.24. In Isaiah 37, verse 16, Isaiah said, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. And so these are angels that are there that are demonstrating the holiness of God. Notice their eyes. The description of their eyes reveal that they're alert and they're aware of their surroundings. When he begins to describe it, he speaks of living creatures, a lion, a calf, in other words, these angels may symbolize the attributes of God. These images are also associated, you might find this interesting, with each gospel. Over the years, uh, church, through church tradition, each gospel actually has an am, animal that symbolizes the gospel. Matthew, in the ancient, the ancients would look at Matthew and they would, they would speak of the gospel of Matthew portrayed as a lion because he's majestic, he's the king of beasts. He represented omnipotence. And so Matthew is uh, symbolized by a lion. Mark, the gospel of Mark, is a calf or an ox, a domestic animal. It, it described patience and labor. To the Jew, the lion would represent majesty. To the Roman, a calf or an ox would symbolize a working animal. Because the highest uh, to be attained in the Roman Empire was to be a servant of Rome. So the calf became that symbol because it was domestic and it was patient and it labored. Luke was, was a, intended to appeal to the Greek thinker. And that's why it was symbolized by the gospel of Luke is symbolized by a man. Because the Greeks idealized humanity. And so Luke is symbolized by a man, the greatest of God's creations. It signifies intelligence and, and rational power. And John's gospel is symbolized by an eagle, the greatest of birds, symbolizing sovereignty and supremacy. So these images you find here represent omnipotence, 
patience, labor, intelligence, power, and sovereignty, and supremacy as he sees these things. In verse 8, it says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. They do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This reminds us of what Isaiah saw. And as it speaks here, Isaiah said that it had, they had two wings covering their faces because they're not to see the unveiled glory of God. Two wings that cover their feet because they are standing on holy ground. Two wings that are used for flying. They're ready to serve God instantly, these four living creatures. But notice what they're saying. They're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Holiness. I'll take a moment to share about this. You know, in the, when I first got saved, and some of you can relate to this, I, I came into the kingdom I got born again. I was born again. And I came into my faith in Christ from a background of being aware of a God that I believed was distant and powerful. And the way I was raised, which it served me well now in some ways, but the way I was raised and the religious training I had and the influence of those who could influence me concerning those things, I thought God was always mad at me. I thought God was angry at me constantly, which is in a sense true because according to John 3.36, the wrath of God abides continually on the person who doesn't have a relationship with him. So in a sense, I was right about that. God is angry because I was not a, I wasn't a believer in him. I wasn't serving him. I'd never been born again. And so there, in a sense, there was truth to that, that, that God is always angry. But what happens is I get saved. And when I get saved, I enter into something that I'd never really been taught about called the grace of God. Some of you can understand what I'm trying to say. The grace of God. I can still remember speaking to a friend of mine. His name is George. He's the one who stood up with me when I got saved. And I still remember speaking to him and telling him, oh, if I get to go to heaven, man, if I go to heaven, if I get to go to heaven. And George, he was only a, a few months older in the Lord than me, but every once in a while when I would say that in the first three months of my salvation, he would look at me and say, but you are going to heaven. And I'd say, I, I don't. I don't know how that's even possible, George. I still, he'd say, listen, he said, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses you from all sin, David. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He would tell me patiently, and I'd say yes. He'd say, don't you know that the Bible says that you became the temple of God's spirit, that God's spirit dwells in you? I'd say, well, I've heard that. He said, no. And I remember the conversation, it was more than once, that I'd have with him. Perhaps some of you understand what I'm trying to say. I was, I was raised with this idea of works righteousness. If I work hard, then he'll, he'll see my good works are, are, are heavier in weight than my bad works. And that's kind of how I was raised. I, I had a system of sins that I was taught that there are what are called mortal sins and that you better get rid of them. And then there are what are called venial sins, which are smaller and lesser. And I was taught that. Some of you were too. But what that did is it gave to me this, in, this, this, this sense of, of I need to do something better so that I can have good works outweigh my bad life. And now I'm hearing about the grace of God. I'm hearing that God forgives sinners. And uh, that was such, such, such a thought was too wonderful for me. And so I was, I was stuck in that. And a lot of people are like that. I remember a pastor who was trying to illustrate grace. And he was sharing with the church. And, and he was saying to the church, um, God's grace is a free, unmerited favor that gives to you. And he had a potted plant. And he, 
he lifted it up and he says, I want to illustrate the grace of God. It's free. And so whoever wants this potted plant, come up. It's, it's yours. Nobody would get up to take it in this, this church. He was, nobody would get up to take it. And finally, a, a lady walks up and he says, man, you know, saves the illustration. Here you go. He hands her the plant. And then she walks away with it, sits down. He finishes his, his story about grace and he says, it's unmerited. She did nothing to deserve it. I gave it as a free gift. All she needed to do was receive it. And so at the end of the church service, he went to the back. He was greeting the people, saying goodbye to them. When the woman came with her potted plant, and he reached his hand to shake her hand, and she reached out and took his hand, but he felt something on his palm, and he looked. It was a $20 bill. And he looks at her, and he says, what is this? She said, such a beautiful plant can't be free. So she missed the whole picture, the whole illustration of grace. She was still trying to pay for something he had, he had labored to explain was free. And I was that way. I was raised in a mentality that if I work hard and I do good, then I receive God's mercy and grace. But what happened is I heard the gospel, and the gospel speaks of God's unmerited favor. But I, at the same time, had a difficulty in receiving God's unmerited favor. I finally was able to do it. But this is what has happened in the last many years since I got saved. Is people, many people who are professing to know Christ don't have the fear of God in them now. They don't have a sense of doing right for right's sake. They don't have a sense with them. Many don't have within them the sense that their lives are to be different, transformed. They're supposed to be brand new that good works are not going to save them, but are a part of their salvation. In other words, a person is, is known to be saved because of the good works that they do for Christ's sake. And what has happened is this concept of nobody can go to heaven because nobody's good has been reversed to this concept, oh, in God's grace, I can do whatever I want and still go to heaven. And we're seeing a lot of that today. There's a balance. There's a balance. Holy, holy, holy is what the scripture says. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. Holiness is one of God's attributes. Holiness speaks of separation from impurity. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, a woman by the name of Hannah said, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. In Psalm 111, verse 9, it says he provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. When Moses went to the, to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, the Bible says that there was lightning and thundering and all kinds of loud noise. And when Moses came down, the people of Israel said, you go and you talk to him. We don't want to go up there. They were so afraid at the awesome presence of God as they saw what was taking place. I think that within us today, guys, we need to return to that concept of holiness. When, when you stand before the Lord, I promise you, you're not going to be just kind of goofing off. I promise you that when you see him, you're going to raise your hands and surrender. You know, very often when we speak concerning the raising of our hands, we forget that the raising of our hands is not just simply praise. The raising of your hands in Scripture symbolizes surrender and submission. So when you are worshiping the Lord and we say, let us raise our hands to the Lord, it's not simply the joyful thing. It's a surrender. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that if, a, if an officer says you know, raise your hands. It's not so that you can praise him. You're surrendering. That's what you're doing. You're surrendering. And when you raise your holy hands, like Paul says in prayer, raising holy, I, he said, I will let the men pray everywhere. Raising holy hands. It's an act of submission. It's an act of awareness that God is holy and we're not without him. And that our raising of our hands is surrender. We used to call it sweet surrender. It's surrender to the Lord, who is the almighty, the glorious king, the king of the universe, the one who loved us, the one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, 
to die on a cross for us, the one who gave us the Holy Spirit, who indwells us, who empowers us, who gifts us, and by his grace, he has saved us. And that's why we raise our hands to the Lord. That's why. Because he has done that for us. That's what Christianity is. It's a raising of your hands in submission, and we cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. And we will see him face to face in this place called heaven that is so glorious, you can't even explain it, you can't even describe it. That's what's going to take place. He is holy, and he is awesome. There's no one like him. He is, there's no rock, Hannah said, like our God. And what happens? Well, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. There's your example of worship in scripture. These elders show us how to glorify, worship, and praise Jesus Christ. By casting their crowns before him, they recognize that if not for his grace, they would never have had victory over sin and death. Heaven is their home because God made it possible for them to be there. Heaven is their home. I've had the opportunity over the years to go into Europe. The first time I ever went to Europe, I was 25, actually 24. And when I was in France, I went to the palace there at Versailles. I've had a chance to go into Madrid and to see the palace. I've been able to see Buckingham Palace in England. I've seen human palaces. And I have to tell you, sometimes when you see these immense structures, it actually can take your breath away. When you walk into rooms, huge room after room after room, filled with priceless paintings and, and decorated with such ornate opulence, it blows your mind. And if I were there inside of, we'll say, Buckingham Palace and Queen Elizabeth were to come walking out, I would show her respect. As an American, I don't bow before foreign kings or queens. I would show her respect. But when you go to heaven and you see Jesus, there's not going to be a hesitation whatsoever. You are going to see something that can't be described. Oh, please help us, Lord, to see this for just a moment. You are going to see something so beyond your imagination. You are going to see glory that you have never seen ever on the face of the earth. Colors that are brighter, sounds that are crisper. And you're going to see the one on that throne seated there. The one who gave his life for you. Do you think you're going to just kind of stand there going, yeah, this is cool? You fall before him and you say, oh, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Oh, God, this is my home. You prepared a place for me. This is where I live and I don't have to pay rent. It's all been paid for. This is for, oh, God. Can you get it in your heart today, please, a little bit? Earth is not our home. We're just passing through. One day we'll see him face to face. We'll fall on our faces before him and we'll worship the Lord. That's called Christianity. That's called Christianity. Yes, there'll be a glad reunion. Yes, You'll get to see those who went before you, a mom, a dad, a grandmother, grandfather, children who are be believers who, who went before you. Yes, it will be a glad reunion. And yes, it'll be great. It'll be wonderful. But what makes it wonderful is we see 
him, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world, who gave me his righteousness, who filled me with his spirit, who supported me every step of the way of my journey to heaven and welcomes me in. That's what heaven is going to be for us. And we walk in, oh God, every moment was worth it. And all the complaints and the whines and the whys are left outside of the gates. Left outside. I just got to ask you why you didn't give me that girl in eighth grade. I really loved her. Oh, no. Sin, sin is not allowed in heaven. No evil is allowed in heaven. People make a big mistake when they think they can take their sins with them as baggage or part of their life. No, it doesn't enter in. There's no evil in heaven, only purity and holiness. And that's why the Lord, by his blood, has washed and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. So when we stand before him, we're robed in his righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son, the glory that we receive in terms of the glory he imparts to us is only because he first has it and gives us this beauty that come from him. And that's why it's very important for us to know who you are and who he is. He is holy. And without him, we are not. For his word says, I am holy. Therefore, you be holy also. How can that take place? The gospel message tells us he imputes to us the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He gives us a garment that enables us to enter in. He gave us the story of a man who tried to enter into a wedding feast without the wedding garment. And the, the one who invited all to come said, where is your wedding garment? He came in on his own, and Jesus made it very clear that that man was cast out because he tried to come in with his own garment when the garments had been provided by the host. You have to have the garment provided by the host to enter in. This man didn't. He was cast out. How do we enter in? Through the righteousness of Christ. Imparted to us as we said, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What does that do? It awakens us to our sin, his holiness. What does that provoke? Gratitude in our heart that we might say, oh God, I am a miserable wretch. But with you, I have been made into your son or your daughter. And for that, I will worship you forever. And people say, oh, heaven sounds boring. All you do is worship and praise God. That means heaven's not for you. You're not ready for it. Why? Because you're wearing your own righteousness. But when you get an idea, a knowledge of what God has washed you clean from, gratitude is in your heart. My mom used to say, we got to have an attitude of gratitude. And that's true. An attitude of gratitude. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for me. John got a glimpse of heaven. We're going to see a little bit more of it next time we're together, a little deeper look. But John had a glimpse of heaven.